It's October already. Can't fathom that it's October already. Um, each month we do a new sermon series. Uh, last month we were preaching on the uh, mayoral proclamation and, and its implications for us here at the church and in uh, the city of Fulton. This month we're preaching on something a little bit different. So I want to call on Dave, or Provost, to, he's supposed to, that's signed seats. We have a signed seats, right? He's supposed to sit right there, right? We're going to read Matthew uh, 418. What does Matthew 418 say? This is our uh, 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 scripture for the month, for the sermon series. And Dave would tell us that come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's what he would say in a heartbeat. He's not here, so we pick on Dave next week maybe. Right? Our, our sermon series this week is uh, that he is going to make us all of us in this room, fishers of men. I get the sense that it, it's something along these lines. Anybody ever play sports? i got to put my hand down. <laughs> I was a band geek. Um, you wanted to play, right? If you were riding the pine all the time, if you were sitting on the bench all the time, right, you're not in the game. Everybody wanted to play. Uh, put me in, coach, would be the way that we would want to say it. And so we're encouraged this month to get off the bench. Every single person in this room, get off the bench, get in the game. So I wanted to bring us to uh, an understanding of this is one of my favorite scriptures. I, I use it all the time, all the time, all the time. But Jesus, when he was here, after he died and paid the price, everything that Chris just talked about, he said, right before he arose and ascended to heaven, right, he said, Great Commission, right? Go make disciples. So let's read that text right now. In Matthew uh, 28, if you want to go there, this is found, by the way, in four different places in Scripture. It's found in Matthew, it's uh, Mark, and Luke at the tail end of each of those. It's also found in the book of Acts, right at the very beginning of the books of Acts. It reads a little bit different in each one, but I really like the way it reads in Matthew 28. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." So do you see this positionally? Do you see this thing where, there, where God has bestowed on Jesus all authority, all power, all dominion over all of heaven and over all of earth? And then Jesus says to us, therefore, because this power has been bestowed on me, he is commissioning each and every one, therefore, you go and make disciples. So right, sometimes you might hear somebody, well, well, yeah, but Pastor Steve, I have the gift of administration, so maybe I should, you know, make sure that we have the coffee for the uh, but maybe, maybe I should. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you. But maybe I'm not the one who should be going out at no, no, that's not what Jesus said, is it? He said, to all your commission. Your duty, the thing I am calling you to do, is to everyone go and make disciples. All right? Let's keep that in mind as, as we proceed. What is a disciple? Oh, I, I should say this. Um, if I'm talking to any of you in uh, fellowship later on, or let's say all morning so far this morning, I left my hearing aids at home. And so what I just heard from the congregation was, <laughs> what is a disciple? Really loud for the deaf guy. A follower. A follower, a follower of Jesus, yeah. Read Bible. Uh, read Bible, yeah. Somebody who reads the Bible continuously, yes. What else? What makes a disciple? Relationship. Sorry, you know, that's a danger to the front row. I probably will spit on you. Uh, <laughs> Relationship, right? What, re, tell me about relationship. Disciple, what is a disciple relationship? It, it's, a, it's a relationship where that person is giving you authority in their life. 
So you're talking about the discipling relationship between people. Critically important. Yeah. There's also the, yeah, he gets a gold star. You could have said it, then you'd get a gold star. There's also the discipling relationship such that the two of you are pointing to God and, 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 and connecting deeper with God. So there's those two relationships, critically important. He's already preached half my message. Okay, we can keep talking about discipleship. But um, one of the things that I want to point out is that this, in the Bible, you'll find that they use the word disciple, 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 disciple as you read your Bible. And then you'll find out later on, late in Acts, they started calling disciples Christians. So think in your mind a little bit um, as far as synonymous. Disciple and Christians are are close or nearly the same creature, all right, biblically. Um, there should be life change, life-changing, impacting relationships, as Chris was just saying. Hit the nail on the head. Now, let me give you an illustration of, of the opposite of this. When I was a young man, uh, a, a buddy of mine in high school, senior year of high school, his family decides, hey, we're moving out of town. And he's like, I don't want to go to school for six months of my final year of high school and not know a single person there. So um, James Kantowitz came and stayed at my house. He, he was a quasi-brother of mine for six months, and uh, he went to high school with me and, until he graduated. It was, it was great. You want to talk about relationship? I have no idea where James is these days. I don't know anything about James these days. You know, you know, shame. This is the opposite. This is the opposite. If you're in a good, hearty relationship, I should be asking you, what's going on in your life? What are you struggling with? What are you, what are you celebrating? What's, what's going on that's awesome? You know what I mean? There should be, and it should also be two ways. It's not so much, it is somewhat, but it's not always mentor and somebody who's learning. It, it's 100% both ways. Um, this relationship should be unto life change, and it should be where we, you saw in the scripture, you saw in the scripture, it said that we would come to obey him, right? That this, this life-changing relationship would be unto um, a deeper relationship and bringing us into obedience. One of the things that if you read that whole thread that's kind of written under, uh, is that there should be multiplication. If we're doing the Great Commission, there should be multiplication. Um, you should be multiplying yourself in whatever role you're in. We're going to come back to that a little bit. Who should do this? Every single one of us. Um, <laughs> Andrew, I, I preached this a couple of times. Andrew was impacted by Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, Andrew, come follow me. And Andrew said, okay, right? He had a life-changing interaction with Jesus, and was the very first thing he did. Let me go get my brothers! Right? He, he was, with godly authority, going and making disciples 14 seconds after he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Right? Who should be, who should be discipling? Absolutely every single Christian. Right? When you've been a Christian for exactly 14 seconds, you can begin discipling. Now, I would encourage you to have <laughs> some other leadership in your life, but um, you can also begin bringing others to Christ. You can also go. Um, this, is, this is somewhat of a, a leadership role, wouldn't you say? We, we use the phrase in, in Christianese, right, we're gonna, that I had the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ. Yes? We, you've heard that phrase before? Um, this is somewhat of a leadership role. Who's supposed to do this? Let's review. Uh, Absolutely everyone. How many people are in a leadership role? Absolutely everyone, right? So I want to talk about leadership a little bit today. Um, making disciples. So I also want to bring a little clarification. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry. I'm going to read Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and I've preached on this a bunch of times. I really like this scripture. It, it was he who gave some to be apostles, 
some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We are to equip the congregation for the work of the ministry. His job is not so much to do the work of the ministry. You do, and as a Christian, you're supposed to. But his main job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. My main job in this congregation is to equip the saints to do the ministry, right? Who is supposed to do the ministry? All right. Again, leadership role. Authority within the church. You've got it. Proclaimed by God. A growing and alive church exists because Jesus changed people who then go out and help to change people, right? If you look around this room, has anybody noticed that this church has grown in the last year or two, right? Yeah. Yes? Why did that happen? Well, Colby's here, and he's been doing a really lovely job. Yes, Colby's here, he's been doing a really lovely job. Why did that really happen? Look around the room. All y'all's doing the work of the ministry. And people are coming to deeper and deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and being impacted by the real God of the universe, right? And so people want more, people want more, people want more. This is exactly the way it's supposed to happen. Main thing that we're going to talk about today is, is kind of what I've been leading up to. Multiplying disciples. You and I are charged with multiplying disciples disciples. You and I are charged with multiplying Christians. We are to lead people towards life change. So we're going to talk about leadership today. One of my favorite topics. I love talking about leadership. All y'all are in a leadership role. Leadership. Some are gifted. Some are just gifted for leadership. Leadership is one of those areas that I, I is really special to me. I I study it. I study it. I must, have, I must have 20 books on leadership. I love studying leadership. I was going to bring my, my book in, but it's at work because I read at work. I love the, the topic of leadership. I study these books, but I also study people and how they interact with other people. Um, some people are, are passionate, nuts, crazy about leadership. Some people just interact with other people and have the God-given ability to just bring them along. That's a leadership role. So there's people who are just gifted for leadership and ought to be, but then there's absolutely everybody ought to be in this leadership role. Leadership role in kingdom business. Every person in this room, leadership role in kingdom business. And so we start to talk about, well, what in the world is leadership? And the first place that I want to go is I want to talk to you about what leadership looks like in the world. How many people have a job or had a job or so a whole bunch of people retired here, right? But how many people either have a job or had a job? What is the working model within the world of leadership? My boss said do this, yes? So then I do this, right? There's a hierarchy within your work life. This is sort of the world model. And it goes like this. There's a chain of command. My boss says jump. I say how high. My boss has a boss. His boss says jump. He says how high, right? There's a hierarchy. There's a boss and a boss and a boss and a boss, and a boss right? You do what you're told. Sometimes you're put in your place. In a work environment, it's because I, I said, you pay me money, and I will do what you tell me to do, right? As long as it's ethical, as long as it doesn't violate what I believe in. You pay me money, I do what you tell me to do, right? That's fine for a relationship, but I want to look at it a little bit. Does it function? Yeah. Are we getting the very best out of people in that environment? Not really, right? When you go to work and you say, you know, pound that nail, you got it. 
But you're not, you're not pouring yourself. You're not, I can't get you pound a nail, right? You're not, there's not that overjoyed passion. I'm into it. I understand the importance of it. And, and boy, I, I can't wait to pound the very next nail. That's not what we have in the, in the world model of leadership. So I want to look to you, and I want to talk to you about, I read this book. So Sandy, if you could put that little image up. I read this book. Um, this is just one of my favorite leadership books. It looks like that. Gung Ho. And it, it's basically a guy that was running this manufacturing plant. And it was purely the, the world model where you got a boss and you do what the boss says. And this plant was failing and coming to the end of its existence. Uh, they were going to close the plant down in a year, and they said to this guy, hey, you got a year. If you can turn it around in a year, great. If you can't, we're going to shut her down. And so what he did is he took the world model and he applied Jesus to it. And he started to lead not from a do it because I said so model. He led in a different way, and I want to describe these. I want to try to go quick through these because I don't want to bog down too much. But he had three main points. In this book, if, you ever, if you're into leadership at all, I would encourage you to read that book. But his three main points were this. The first one, super important, establish a clear and inspiring goal. I'm going to pound a nail. After that, I'm going to pound a nail. Not clear and inspiring. There should be something that is driving you. Um, what is the chief end of mankind? What is the chief purpose of human beings on this earth, according to God? That we would glorify God, that we would bring glory and praise to his name. We would, we would share with others the majesty of who he is. I could go on and on, right? Chief end of mankind is um, worshiping and praising God. By the way, on that topic, I got a little homework for you. If you want to dig into worshiping and praising God, the, go, to, go to Chronicles. Um, what is it? First Chronicles 16, 7 through 36. Sometime during this week. This is where David, David installs, gives authority to worship leaders. And he, uh, First Chronicles 16, starting at verse 7. This is where, where David gives authority to his, his worship leaders to praise God. And, and what, if, if you read this during the week, what I would encourage you to do, maybe do it when nobody else is at home or something like that. But I would encourage you. Um, David did not have a microphone. So David didn't have a mic. And David is speaking to, I imagine, thousands of people, hundreds at minimum, you know, maybe multiple thousands of people. David did not say it like this, right? David is proclaiming this. So if you, if you want to read this and get a feel for it, in your uh, studies this week, maybe when nobody's around the house, proclaim it as if you were speaking to a thousand people, right? Right, just, just this shy of shouting and read that scripture like that. I would encourage you to do that. And you see the chief end of mankind. We are to praise him, give him all glory. If you look at our inspiring goal, what's the thing that would drive us to get up in the morning? What's the thing that would drive us to have some passion um, about what we do. Go make disciples. If we do that, what happens? Speak to the deaf guy. Enthusiasm spreads. Enthusiasm spreads. If you make a disciple who wasn't one before, all the angels in heaven rejoice. The reality for that person is for all time different. Somebody took the time to do that for me personally, you personally, every single person in this room. Somebody helped you, urged you to become a disciple, to become a Christian. So if we do that, is that inspiring enough for us? Let me ask you this question. Why do we do the Garden of Eden thing? Yeah, we, sh we share the love of God with others. We share, we, we meet needs uh, for other people. Um, but it's easier giving more so we can give. Uh, the deaf guy's got to way louder. But we have to care for the poor. Care for the poor, the word says to, 
we're, we're into that. Yep, yep, yep. come back to the relationship piece, right? Do you have an opportunity to disciple someone that you are not in relationship with? Probably not. If you have no relationship with somebody, I, 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 I want to say probably not. I'm not saying it's impossible. You walk down the street and bump into somebody and you start telling them about Jesus, it's possible. Much, much more likely you've got somebody in your life that you're in relationship with and you have the opportunity to talk to them about what God has done in your life, and maybe God would do that same thing in, in their life. So relationship is huge important. If the boss tells us to do something and we do it, what are we working towards from a passion and a joy standpoint? Very little, not a whole lot. In the context of God saying, go make disciples, and we're about his business, there's a whole different level of joy. The next point that this book brings up is uh, build trust and communication. So if you're a leader, how many people in this room are leaders? All. If you're a leader, there should be trust in communication. Um, let me give you two examples. First of all, I had a, I had a boss, best boss I ever had, uh, Jim Vecchio. He still lives around here. If anybody knows Jim, he, he was the best boss I ever had. And I always knew at work that he had my back 100%. He would tell me, he would tell me um, you know, I would mess up and miss something in an estimate, and we'd lose thousands of dollars, right? And he'd bring me into his office, and he'd say, you messed up. Don't do that again. The only time he ever got mad at me, ever, ever, and then he would have my back. He would go to the purchasing department, and he'd say, you know, we're so sorry. We, the proposal department, missed this cost. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again. And Steve would not get thrown under the bus. Hugely integral man. The only time I ever saw him get mad is when I did it twice. Um, he, he expressed himself. Still, still very polite. Still very polite. Um, trust in communication, Mr. Barry Lee. He's hiding behind stuff back there. Yeah, see, ducking and weaving. Mr. Barry Lee. Um, Barry communicates fantastic. Barry is probably one of the better communicators um, that I see in this church. He, he, when he's working with his team, he just happens to copy the elders, and he's always, you know, hey, what do you want to do here, and, and what are we doing next? And he's always in constant communication with his, with his team for the Garden of Eden, and, and they have trust, I would imagine, building with Barry, right? So this uh, trust in communication is hugely important as a leader. And the last one we're going to um, bring up is appreciation and recognition. If you are a leader, how many people are leaders in this room? Everybody. Absolutely everybody. If you are a leader, there should be recognition and appreciation for those who you lead. I'm going to take this opportunity to speak to that directly right now. Last week, my team was up. Oh, we had fun, right? Um, my mom's in Georgia, and so we were a little thin on the team. And uh, uh, Chris had a family event. Chris Gable, and he's down there cranking away. He's getting other people involved, and he's making pizzas and going about his business. And he said, Steve, i got to leave right after service because i got this family event. And we're working away, working away. It's, it's like 12 o'clock. Yeah, you guys made some pizzas last week too, didn't you? Or some, I know a few people did. Yeah. Um, cranking away, cranking away, and finally it dawns on me, wait, you had some family event. I had to kick him out. Get out of here, because he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave. He was, he was just cranking away, right? So Chris did a wonderful job. And then we were a little thin. Chris had to leave. My mom's in Georgia. And the elders just said, we'll stick around, right? And so um, Colby, Johanna, Heather, Chris, all were there. And then we had opportunities for ministry, multiple places. It was just a beautiful time. Um, it's important if you're a leader, put people on the spot. Call out Chris and say, Chris, you know what? You did some, you did some really nice ministry. You, Chris, did some really nice ministry last week. And, and how often awesome is that? You, Heather, stepped up and just said, yep, 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 I'm here. I'll help. You, Barry Lee, communicate with your team. Wonder you know, it's good, right, and appropriate to give recognition where it's due. So I want to bring that up real low. Oh, boy. Um, I'm going to press ahead real quick here. There's, there's a couple other things I want to talk about 
and I want to talk about servant leadership. This is a concept that is critically important for success um, for leaders within the church. I need eight volunteers. I need the first volunteer. Lucinda said, you just stay right there. I'll come to you. But here's what I'm going to need you to do. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to need you to read, Sandy. First scripture. Would you read that right out loud? Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now here's the part where I put you on the spot. What's that mean? I don't know. You have to serve to be great. You have to serve to be great. You have to serve to be great, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Next scripture. Somebody else want to volunteer? Yeah, now you know what's happening. It's a little bit. <laughs> Could you read that scripture, please? For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What does that mean to us? Came to serve. Came to serve. Who, who is a bigger leader? Who is a bigger leader than Jesus Christ? What did he come and do? Serve and gave his life. I need another volunteer. I need another volunteer. Jesus washing the disciples' feet is an example of service. What does that mean to us? It means that he did a job that the servants were supposed to do in the house. The lowest job. Right. Yep. The, the dirt. Yeah. I need another volunteer. Do that? nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. What does that mean to us? That one's not as clear cut. Do things for, do things for the point of helping someone else yes. and not to make yourself like look yes. better or whatever. We, yes, we don't need to be saying, hey, look at me, didn't I do awesome? We're, we're serving and caring for others. Somebody else, another volunteer. Hey. Serve one another humbly in love. What's that mean? Um, it's kind of hard to love people when you're not humble. Say that again for the deaf person. It's kind of hum, hum, uh, hard to love people when you're not humble. So when you're oh. prideful, you're usually thinking about yourself and yeah. not others. Because yeah. love is the opposite of that. So when you're humble. You and and you could say the opposite. So yeah. you're not really flowing or functioning in love if you're, if you're doing it from a place of arrogance. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else. You got to talk in. You got to <clears throat> hold it. 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. What does that mean to us? Uh, it says in Philippians, have this attitude in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. But oh my gosh, that's a fantastic he example of himself, that. Yeah. Made himself uh, an infant. So I, I didn't even think of that for an example for this sermon, but that would have been perfect. Imagine uh, Jesus Christ, right? Active in creation. Jesus Christ pulled mountains up out of the sea at his will, right? He spoke things into existence with God and the Holy Spirit. He had that kind of power in the world, and yet he said, eh, I'm going to set that power aside. I'm going to come as a infant and serve in the, the deepest way that has ever been achieved. Somebody else? Am I running out of scriptures? One more? Two more? The greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. What does that mean to us? I think that we all have the equal ability to serve one another if the greatest is like the youngest. Yep. The greatest, the greatest is likely the biggest servant, right? We should be tripping over each other as, as believers. How many people in this room are leaders? All of us. We should be tripping over each other to be the servant of one another. Is that true? Is that what we're reading here? One more. One more, one more. 
Ephesians 6, 7. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord. What does that mean to us? I think that you should, when you do something, do it well and let it, share it with others that you're serving. Let God know that you're there for him. Yes, yes. So if I'm doing something, if I'm doing something for Arena, uh, I should do it as if I'm doing it for God. I should do it, yes. Right? We're serving. Am I out of scripture, Sandy? I can't hear that. I'm deaf. One more. Who's, who's volunteering? turned it off sorry thought we were out there we go <laughs> exodus 18 13 to 19 the next day moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people and they stood around him from morning till evening what does that mean Sharing, um oh nope this is it yeah, yeah, sorry we're getting ahead of ourselves that's okay. a, that's my next sermon point <laughs> i'll read more of that in a minute yep sorry <sighs> Well, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more. All right. Do we see a, a consistent picture? Does, does Jesus, does the Bible waver on, on us being a servant? No. If you are in a leadership role, and by the way, how many people in this room are in a leadership role? If you are in a leadership role, we are called upon by God to fulfill that leadership role by being a servant. Is that crystal clear to everybody? And, and God's preaching this message because we just rattled through his word and we see that it's true over and over and over and over again. So become servant leaders. Consistent message. Uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Multiple uh, Multiplication of leadership. This is where we're going to that exodus. I want to give you a picture of Moses, right? Moses you know, let my people go, let my people go, finally, fair, oh, right, Red Sea parts, away they go. Probably talking about two million uh, people, and depending on how uh, it's interpreted, that may have been too many, uh, two million men plus their families. They may have just counted the men, I don't know. Two, two million to seven, eight, nine, ten million. Who knows how many the number was. A million people... There's more than a million people that live in Oswego County and Onondaga County, and I, I was going to look this up, right? A million people, two million people is a huge number. It skirts the edge of unfathomable by our minds. Two million people, and they're wandering around in the desert, yes? So what happened? you got to care for two million people. There are some... People get along perfectly all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you put two million people together, moving around the desert, and from time to time there may arise a dispute. Moses' father-in-law visited him, and what Moses would do every single day is he would get up in the morning, and he would come outside of his tent and put a chair down there and sit, and from sunrise to sunset, he would act and preside as judge for the whole nation of Israel. And he was overwhelmed. There'd be a line, you know, super long of people who had, who had issues that needed to be addressed. And he would act as judge from morning to evening. And finally, his very wise father-in-law came to him and said, what are you doing? Right? There is a better way. And we're going to read that scripture. Exodus 18, uh, verse 13 says this. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. Then his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, and he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever you have a dispute, it is, whenever uh, they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father replied, 
what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. What scripture is telling us here, and if you read this scripture, it goes on to say that what Moses ended up doing is appointing uh, uh, 10 people that would be head over 100 people that would judge for the people. So there was, there was Moses was doing it all, and then he got 10 more people to do it, and each of those 10 more people got 10 more people to do it, this is the Jethro principle, that if you are a leader, and I think most everybody in this room is a leader, if you are a leader, you should be multiplying yourself. You should be, when you take a leadership role, absolutely day one, you should be, have eyes out for those ten. If you are in a leadership role in worship ministry, you should be looking for the next leader in worship ministry or the next worship person. If you are leading, people keep splitting on me. If you are leading the kitchen ministry, you should be looking for others who can step into the kitchen ministry and maybe lead parts of that ministry. If you're leading, since your wife's not here, I'll pick on you, Doug. If you're leading the fresh food ministry, you should be immediately, day one, looking for who is the multiplication person, who is the next person that would step into that role. If you're functioning as a leader, you should be constantly thinking multiplication. Let me give you an example of this. When I was a young feller, I, I, boy, I love my word, and I, I, uh, I really enjoyed um, talking to other people about God, but I had no clue of gifting in my life yet. And we were going to a, uh, a Bible study, and Chuck Markson pulled me aside, and he said, Steve, I'm not going to be here next week. Do you mind leading this Bible study? And I went, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And so he gave me some notes and whatnot. The next week, I led the Bible study, and God lit me on fire. It's something that I enjoyed the rest of my life, right? Chuck Markson very intentionally looked at the group that he was in, and he said, who, who can be multiplied, and he said, I see this gifting in Steve, and so he encouraged me in that direction. If you are a leader in this place, you should be doing exactly that work all the time, looking for the next, looking to multiply yourself. Oh, boy. I don't have time for that. We need fat leaders. Fat leaders. Faithful, available, teachable. Are you faithful? Um, are you available when God calls you? Hey, I need you to do. Are you available? And are you teachable? Are you somebody who can learn what a leader means? I want to conclude with this. You have authority given to you. You have authority put onto you as leaders within the church. We saw that when we read the Great Commission. Jesus received authority, and then he commissioned us to do his work. We also see, sometimes that can be overwhelming. We also see that in the, in the sermon topic, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So sometimes this burden of leadership can feel, ah, yeah, but I don't know what to do. Follow me, and God says that he will be the one that makes you into fishers of men. So if we simply follow, and Heather mentioned obedience piece, if we follow and obey and do what he tells us to do, he will be transforming us into leaders as we progress. Finally, I wanted to mention that godly leaders serve. They do not boss. Godly leaders do not use the world model of leadership. They use the godly model of leadership, and they put themselves last, and they lift everyone that they lead up to the first place, and they are the foot washers. Godly leaders serve. And lastly, godly leaders multiply themselves. So let's finish today. Lord God, uh, we, praise your, you, we praise your word, Lord God. We praise you for the fact that you communicate so much to us all over your word, that when we ask the questions, what does leadership like? What is leadership like when we do it um, in a godly way, we see that 
your word doesn't have one or two or three or five different places where it says what it's like. It says it over and over and over and over again so that we have clear confidence on how we are to serve one another. Lord God, you, you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of being lifted up here in this place. Lord God, I pray for each person in this room. I pray for every leader in this room that they would look at the responsibility given, the responsibility bestowed, take it very seriously and walk it out with the confidence that you are the one bringing about success and it doesn't so much rely on us. We trust you for these things, Lord Jesus. Amen.